service. Okay, on Sunday mornings we're going through the epistle, the first epistle to the Corinthians, uh, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and today we're in the first chapter and the 18th verse, so you can turn there, uh, and once you do, if you're able, I'll ask you to stand, you can follow along as I read the text. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And by the Holy Spirit, in verse 18, says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let's pray. We'll ask God's blessing on our understanding. Loving Heavenly Father, we desperately need for you to now, by the Holy Spirit, minister to us, to speak to us. Lord, to show us what it is that you would have us to see in this text that we have before us this morning. Lord, we acknowledge before you our need of you. Lord, we're posturing ourselves before you this morning, hungry, and thirsty, knowing that only you can satiate that hunger and thirst. So Lord, will you? We're asking you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Today's teaching is going to be part one of a new series that I've titled, Why the World Mocks Christians. Now I am keenly aware that a title like that can seem somewhat antagonistic, but I'm nonetheless compelled to address this grievous and disheartening topic, uh, especially because that's where we find ourselves in the Word of God today. Uh, I think it's important that we understand that in the last days, and we are in the last days, and I think you know that, that the scoffers, the mockers, those who will ridicule the Christian are going to increase in this, the last hour of human history. This is what the Apostle Peter wrote in his second epistle. I know you're familiar with this from our prophecy updates. He writes in verse 3 of 2 Peter 3, first of all, You must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. And he gets more specific in verse 4 where he says, They will say, Where is this coming? Speaking of the Lord's return in the rapture of the church. Where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. And it's under this banner, as it were, that the world mocks us, ridicules us. Hollywood makes movies about this, mocking the rapture and the last days and the Lord's return. Here's the thing. Not only will they mock Christians who believe in and watch for the rapture, they mock Jesus Christ himself. And the truth of the matter is this should not come as any surprise to us. Jesus said, don't be shocked or dismayed when the world hates you. You have to understand that they, they hate you because of me. Don't take it personally. I love in First Samuel when the Israelites demanded a king like all the other nations. Samuel was hurt. He was dejected, rejected, lamenting before the Lord. I like the word lamenting. It's a pastoral word for complaining. And it sanctifies it. kind of cleans it up a little bit. makes it sound, you know, actually okay. Uh, But he's lamenting before the Lord. And, you know, and the Lord says to him, Hey, Samuel, uh, don't take it personally. (laughs) Welcome to my world. (laughs) I deal with this all the time. And so they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me, and you're feeling rejected because you are my man. 
You are my prophet. You are my judge. The world hates us because we are his disciples. So we're, if you will, guilty by association. I'm of the belief that this explains why it is that Scripture is replete with passage after passage that both warn us and even encourage us as believers in the face of such ridicule. The question isn't so much a matter of will Christians be mocked and ridiculed, rather it's more why. Why are Christians so mocked and ridiculed, especially in these last days? Well, enter 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and our text today in verse 18. The Apostle Paul is about to show us by the Holy Spirit how it is that we can navigate in a world not our home that sees Christians as being ignorant and foolish. <laughs> if you doubt this, just go rent a DVD and watch a movie, uh, careful what you watch, <laughs> but without exception, the Christian is always portrayed as the pervert, the convict, the idiot, the foolish, and the list goes on and on. Very sad. Now, in order for Paul to accomplish this, this showing us how it is that we can navigate in a world such as this, it's incumbent upon him to communicate what I'm going to call the paradoxical irony. Let me explain that. The paradox, the oxymoron of little strength, meek power. This is that in our day and age where we have these oxymorons like when we go out to a restaurant and order jumbo shrimp. That's an oxymoron. Or as Gail Irwin, my favorite, is his, his oxymoron is Microsoft works. I'll just leave that with you. You can take that one to the throne. But it's a, it's a paradox, isn't it? This, this faith, this walk with Jesus Christ, it's a paradox, it's an oxymoron, it's ironic, is it not? And in order for us to understand why it is that the world hates us so, we have to get comfortable with the dynamic of our paradoxical faith. It is little strength. It is life via death. It is a paradox. It is an irony. Now here's the problem. The world views Christianity and the message of the cross as foolish, naive, idiotic, if you please. And moreover, they see Christians as being stupid, truly ignorant because we believe in a savior think about this who didn't save himself notice I didn't say who couldn't save himself no the savior didn't save himself does that sound a little familiar like the other criminal being crucified with the Christ the savior of the world who spit in his face in his rejection of the Savior, saying to him, if you are the Savior, save yourself. Couldn't understand how it is that, I mean, how can you be the Savior of the world, yet you're on the same Roman cross that I am, soon to meet your ultimate death. Are you the Savior? Save yourself. Well, I suppose that this God who's supposed to be all-powerful must then be foolish to not use his power to save himself from this Roman crucifixion 
on this cross. And furthermore, for so-called Christians to actually believe in this nonsense, it makes them bigger fools than the God they purport to put their faith and trust in. And herein lies the paradox and the irony, such that it's the opposite that's true, which is why God's wisdom and God's power is foolishness and weakness to man. Actually, this explains our first reason that the world mocks Christians. It's found in our text, verse 18. Simply put, it's because they are perishing. Dare I say, they're on their way to hell. Pretty strong. Here, Paul says that the message of the cross, interesting, listen, is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. God becoming a man. What a paradox. What an irony. Now, what Paul is saying here is those who are perishing see a Savior being crucified on a cross to bring salvation as utterly absurd and foolish because why? They're perishing. It's for this reason that man rejects and even ridicules Christianity and with it, the Christians who believe in it, which ironically proves that they're going to hell. Henry Morris of this writes, those who regard Christianity as foolishness, rejecting and perhaps even ridiculing God's word, thereby prove to others that they are perishing in sin on their way to hell. It really exposes them. They cannot, their minds cannot wrap around such a spiritual truth because they're spiritually blind. They cannot discern the things of the Spirit. They know not the language of heaven. By the way, this ridiculing of Christians under the banner of thinking Christianity is foolish, it's not new. <laughs> it's getting worse today, yes, but it's been happening for over 2,000 years. And by the way, let me parenthetically say that we have been in the last days for 2,000 years. These are the last two days, a thousand years to us as one day to the Lord. These are the last two days of human history as we know. We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. So when people say, hey, do you, do you believe we're living in the last days? I, I you know, like to, just, in a sanctified way, of course, pastoral, of course. Just, uh, actually, no, I don't. I don't believe, <gasps> wait a minute, don't you teach Bible prophecy? Yeah, but I don't think we're in the last days. We're in the last moments, the last seconds of world history. You know, it's interesting. There's this art called the Alex Semenos. I hope I'm, of course, I'm, I'm sure I'm slaughtering it. The Alex Semenos Graffito. It's also known as the Graffito Blasfemo. <laughs> In other words, blasphemous graffiti. Can we just put it into modern day terms. It's an inscription that's carved in plaster and displayed on a wall in a museum in Rome. And according to Wikipedia, it's alleged to be among the earliest known pictorial representations of Christ's crucifixion. Here it is. The image pictured here depicts a human-like figure attached to a cross and possessing the head of a donkey. To the left of the image is a young man, apparently intended to represent Alex Semenos, 
a Roman soldier or guard raising one hand in a gesture possibly suggesting worship. You have to understand in the Middle Eastern culture, in the Arab culture, uh, the donkey, uh, I won't use the King James uh, translation for donkey, but uh, <laughs> which in, in a way you might want to because it packs more punch, but it's like the ultimate uh, curse to call somebody uh, a donkey uh, in, uh, in the uh, Middle East. Well, the inscription is accepted by authoritative sor- sources to be a mocking depiction of a Christian in the act of worship. The donkey's head and crucifixion would both have been considered insulting depictions by contemporary Roman society. Crucifixion continued to be used as an execution method for the worst criminals until its abolition by the Emperor Constantine in the fourth century and the impact of seeing a figure on a cross is comparable to the impact today of portraying a man with a hangman's noose around his neck or seated in an electric chair Uh, this is another topic for another time but we have truly sanitized the cross we have really prettified it and sort of adorned it and In so doing, we've taken it out of the arena of its harshness, its bluntness, its ugliness. And we've moved it into the arena, the cleansed arena of tidiness. So it's a little bit more palatable. You have to understand, you know, you probably are wearing a cross, maybe you have earrings or a necklace, nothing wrong with that. But you have to understand that in this time and in that culture, it would be the equivalent of wearing an electric chair around your neck. Can you imagine that fashion statement? That really does make quite a statement. You're identifying with the capital punishment of the day for a capital crime. Well, let's fast forward about 2,000 years to the present day, and here's what we find. There's nothing new under the sun. And I say that because of what we see in the popular music culture, particularly of the day. Now, I really took some time (laughs) this week in anticipation of this teaching to really seek the Lord about what I would or would not uh, share with you, and I will spare you the more blasphemous and grievous album covers from some of today's most famous music artists, uh, simply because they are just too evil, too grievous, too blasphemous to show. However, you'll forgive me, but I do deem it necessary to share a little bit about two particularly, two of these demon-possessed musicians who have clearly sold their souls to the devil and make a mockery of your Savior and my Savior, Jesus the Christ, and the crucifixion of the Christ and the finished work of the Christ on the cross. This first one is Kanye West. We've talked about him before. Seen here on his blasphemous album cover depicting himself as being crucified on a cross as a mockery of Jesus Christ and the crucifixion of the Christ. This is actually one of many not just from Kanye West but Others like Britney Spears, who appeals to a whole nother, you know, audience, particularly a younger uh, female audience. It's on her album titled Peace of Me, where she depicts herself nailed to a cross, and she's covered only by a cloth and her hair. 
an album cover so sexual, it's pornography packaged with blasphemy. I'm only going to show you one more of these, and before I put the image on the screen, I'm going to give you an opportunity, uh, not yet, but I'll just warn you, if you don't want to look at it, it might be disturbing. Uh, I'll just have you, you know, close your eyes or you can turn away. But I just need you to hang in there uh, with me for just a little bit. I think you'll understand where I'm going with all of this and why I'm going there, uh, hopefully at the conclusion of the sermon. Uh, before I put it on the screen, I'll give you the name and the title of the scene. It's actually from a music video. Uh, the group is called Nine Inch Nails. The title of the music video is called Closer. Uh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and put it on the screen. Uh, but uh, So if you don't want to uh, see it, you can, of course, uh, close your eyes, and I'll let you know when it's uh, safe to open them back up again. Uh, this might be, just be disturbing to some. Here it is. Some of the versions of the single to this music video are titled Closer to God which is ironic given that the scene pictured here of a monkey on a cross being crucified is in what looks to be a dark and hellish place, obviously far away, eternally separated from God. One last comment before I change the slide. Is it ironic to you that the name of this group is Nine Inch Nails? You can look now. The reason I point this out is that it's widely believed that the length of the nails used in the crucifixion, which were actually spikes, were nine inches long. Make no mistake about it. Satan was there at the crucifixion. Satan knows the scriptures better than you do, better than I do. Which is why he misquotes the scriptures to deceive us. He's the author of confusion to confusion, to confuse us. He's the father of lies to lie to us. He's the accuser of the brethren who accuses us. He, he was there. He, know, he knows how long those Roman spikes were that they would put into and hammer mercilessly into not the hand, but the wrist of the one being crucified. Don't you find it a little bit interesting that this music band, this group... <laughs> Why wouldn't they call themselves the seven inch nails or the ten inch nails? And by the way, pictured here is the nine inch nails album cover uh, titled Year Zero. Oh, what happened in Year Zero? Theoretically, the crucifixion happened with nine inch nails in Year Zero. And the gun? with the cross? Really? Notice the backward ends in their logo. Do they resemble, pictured to the right, the Hebrew letters for what we call the tetragrammaton, which is the consonants, no vowels, for Jehovah, Yahweh, the Y-H-W-H, that's what Y-H-W-H, the tetragrammaton in the Hebrew for Yahweh, looks like. Is that a coincidence? Given the fact that they seem to have a, an obsession with the crucifixion, why? Why are they making a mockery of our Savior? Why do they mock the cross? Why do they see the cross, the message of the cross, as paradoxical and ironic as it is? Why do they see it as a foolish mockery 
because they're perishing. They're perishing. They've sold their souls to Satan himself for all the fame and sex and money they could ever want. In exchange for their soul, by the way. I'm going to turn a corner and bring it to a close. You'll forgive the abruptness of my doing that. But as I do, I just would kindly ask that you give me your undivided attention for just a couple more minutes. And here's why. Think about this. Isn't it ironic that the world will only mock and blaspheme Jesus Christ and the crucifixion of the Christ? Why is it that they don't mock the other gods, so-called little g gods? Or how about the other religions? Question, when was the last time you heard somebody curse and take the name of Muhammad in vain? You know, they bang their finger with the hammer and, oh, Muhammad! You know, by the way, I, this is one of those things that you might want to try at home. Um, I've, I've tried it. It's fun. It's fun. I mean, the responses you, you're going to get are just, I mean, they are so uh, funny. <laughs> the next time someone takes the name of your Jesus in vain, and, and you know, they, they seem to uh, want God to damn a lot of things. I wonder if it ever dawned on them that the reason why they keep saying God damn it is because, uh, you know, he, they, they're actually getting the answer to their prayer. Something happens and, and they say God damn it and then you can just say to them, well, it looks like God has damned it and that's why, you know, he's doing this and that's why it's happening. Wow, God answers prayer. Prayer is a powerful thing, you know. But I, I always like to ask them, uh, excuse me, and, and, you know, delivery is everything. You know, how you say what you say is paramount in its importance. And I genuinely like to ask them. It's very thought-provoking. You know, honestly, can, can I just ask you a question? You know, I'm a born-again Christian, and you just took the name of my Savior, Jesus Christ, in vain. And you just ask my God to damn what, what is clearly have been, it's been damned. Can I just ask you a question? Why aren't you an equal opportunity blasphemer? <laughs> hey, let's give, hey, tolerant, hey, let's give equal time to Buddha. How about Muhammad? Why don't you take their name in vain? You don't know the answer? Oh. I'll tell you the answer, because they are not God. They are not a true God. They're a false God. Don't you find it interesting that Christianity and Judaism is the most despised and mocked and ridiculed and persecuted religion on the face of the earth? I was having this conversation on Thursday night after our Bible, Bible study with a brother. Very, very interesting. You know, we kind of, well, we, I, you're, you're going to say speak for yourself, Pastor. I like to say that I know that the God of Israel is real. And I'll tell you how I know that. Uh, they're the most persecuted people on earth from the beginning of time, starting with Cain and Abel, by the way. And don't you find it sort of peculiar that it's, and I mean no disrespect to the race, in fact, I'll put myself in there first, how come it's not the Arab people that are the most persecuted people on earth? Why is it not the Japanese or the Chinese or the Portuguese or the Vietnamese? You can fill in the rest of the blanks. Why is that race not persecuted? Why was there not a Hitler uh, putting Japanese people in concentration camps and trying to annihilate them. 
because they're not God's chosen people. The Jews are God's chosen people. So I like to say the God of Israel is real. <laughs> Israel. It's early, I know. Second service might, you know, they'll have had more coffee. They'll be able to grasp the profound truth in that. Okay. I would submit that the very fact that only Jesus Christ is mocked is because Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. And there's no other way to the Father except through Him. He's the only way, the only truth, the only life. He is God incarnate. God tabernacling amongst us, John 1.14. He's the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. And that's why. And by the way, now think this through with me. This is where I need you to really, you know, give me your undivided attention. Doesn't the fact that there are counterfeit Christs, false Christs, mocking of Christ and Christians, does that not validate and authenticate the God of Christianity, the God of Israel? We've talked about this illustration in prior studies, but this is why you'll never see a counterfeit $80 bill. Why don't you see a counterfeit $80 bill? Because there's no such thing as a genuine $80 bill. This is why you see spoofs. This is why they have movies that are blasphemous, mocking the rapture and the last days are so vile. And haven't you kind of noticed that there's been an increase of this? I, there were two movies just in recent months that were released, one about the last days and one specifically about the rapture. Very interesting to me. Why? Well, Revelation says that Satan knoweth he hath but a short time. See, Satan is not omniscient. He's not all-knowing. Satan is not omnipresent. So the next time you say, man, the devil was really on me this last week. Wow, the devil himself. <laughs> you know, he, he can't be in two places at once. No, he's not omnipresent. If you had the devil on you all last week, I'm not worthy. Whoa. I mean, he's sending, you know, the interns to, you know, harass me and oppress me. And you must rate pretty high for Satan himself. He's not omnipresent. And here's the thing. He's not omnipotent. He's not all powerful. Never imagine that Satan is the opposite of God. He is not. The devil, as one so cleverly quipped, the devil is God's devil. And the devil can do nothing. Ask Job about this. Well, you can when we get there. Or you can read his book. Uh, he uh, spells it out quite graphically in there. The devil can't even touch one hair on your head unless God allows him to. Which for me is not a, a big issue anymore. But here's the thing. <laughs> in all seriousness, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. It just makes me feel better. Just humor me. Just, you know. <laughs> anyway, I'm just, I pray, God, please come back before this goes all the way back. But enough of my problems. And God will only allow the devil to touch a hair on your head when it ultimately is for your betterment and his glory. If it serves his purpose and works for his good and your good. And he says, "Go, okay, that's all you can do. Notice how Satan kept tenaciously going back asking, okay, <laughs> well, apparently he passed the test. He hasn't cursed you. Why don't you let me just kill all of his kids? God says, okay, 
That is disturbing, isn't it? That Satan has to ask for permission and that God grants him permission to do that to us. I think about Peter. I love Peter. I feel so bad for Peter. Especially when Jesus said to him, Peter, um, Satan has asked for permission for you to sift you as wheat. It's not in a text, but I can just imagine Peter going, what did you tell him? <laughs> did, did you tell him yes? I did. I told him yes. <laughs> Why? Hey, Peter, take heart. I'm praying for you. But no! Why did you give him permission in the first place? Because when you are converted, <laughs> when you come back, after he sifts you as wheat, as I've given him permission to do, you'll convert the brethren. In other words, this serves my purpose. The devil at the crucifixion was allowed to crucify the Christ. Remember when Peter said to Jesus when he was telling the disciples, I'm about to go to the cross to my death. And here's Peter. <laughs> uh, listen, don't be too hard on Peter, okay? I just think that he gets a lot of bad press. This was a very intense follower who had a very intense love for Jesus Christ. Which is why he responds with, over my dead body. <laughs> and then right after saying, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of your, are yours. It was God who gave you these words when he said, who does man say that I am? And they're there in Caesarea Philippi. And Peter says, you are the son of the true and living God. And then Jesus says, upon the rock of that confession, Peter, I'm going to build my church. I can just picture Peter turning around to the disciples. Did you hear what he just said? <laughs> A few verses later, boom, get thee behind me, Satan. Wait a minute, Jesus, I thought that I was going to, you know, the whole build upon, I thought I was going to be Pope. Nah, it's, uh, <laughs> sorry. You know, it's, there's, there's times where the Holy Spirit says, don't do it, don't do ah, it. It's too late. I did. <laughs> Pray for me. It's, uh... The counterfeit authenticates the genuine. The mocking authenticates the genuine. And sadly, it exposes those who are perishing. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against those who would mock us because they're the ones who cannot understand, will not understand, and they're on their way to hell. And instead of being angry at them, we need to pray for them before it's too late. That they would humble themselves at the foot of the cross and receive Jesus Christ who paid in full for all of our sin vis-a-vis -vis the finished work of the cross. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this verse, just this one verse here in this one chapter in your word. Lord, it explains a lot for us, gives us a needed perspective on why it is that we're the recipients of such mocking and ridicule. Lord, thank you that we are amongst those who are being saved because of the power of the cross. Lord, thank you for the finished work on the cross. And thank you that today we're going to celebrate the finished work on the cross at the communion table. In Jesus' name, amen.